Welcome to The Shanae Show, hosted by yours truly, Kavita Shanae. Today we're joined by Sue Downey. She's a nanny of 25 years and she's here to help all the parents out there with some tips and tricks of how to cope during COVID-19. So Sue, you're a nanny of 25 years. You're also founder of Nanny Palooza. You're going to be a board member of International Nanny Association. And on top of that, you are a nanny for a family near Philadelphia. How old are the children and are you working right now? So I have two kids, a nine-year-old little girl and a five-year-old boy. And I am not technically working right now. I worked for a few weeks when things started getting bad and the parents were at home. And then they decided we were all going to quarantine in our own homes for a while. I'll be going back probably soon once they start working a little bit more. So for now, they're working from home and juggling everything. It's stressful for them, but I do spend time most days on phone calls with the kids, especially the five-year-old. I think we miss each other a lot. And so, and that's nice for them because then they can get a break in the day and we sit and FaceTime and play Legos and I read them books and things like that. So how long have you been with the family? I've been with them for almost nine years. I work for an amazing family. I think it takes two, like that relationship is really valuable. And if you find that match that works well, then you just invest the time to, to keep it healthy and good. Absolutely. I mean, that family's lucky and you're lucky that you guys did find that great match. So now we are beyond the point of social distancing where most parents are just keeping their children at home. So with that in mind, how do you explain what's happening to a young child, a toddler, let's say, and then an older child, say five years and older? So I think you have to sort of take it day by day with them and be truthful about, you know, we want to keep safe, but put it in the terms of general safety that you would talk with them all the time. We don't run in the street without holding a hand. We don't eat food off of the floor. (laughs) There's a virus and we're trying to be safe and not get sick. And so we're going to do these things to keep safe. With older kids, I think that middle age range, you don't want to overwhelm them with science, but I think you want to start explaining the science of it. There was this great sort of meme or video or picture of a row of matches. And this is sort of what we did with the nine-year-old. We just like, here's these matches and you light one. And if they're all together, then it keeps going. It spreads really fast, that virus. But if you take one out, then it stops the spread. And so that's kind of how I would couch it in some terms like that, that they can understand that the science shows us how this virus is being transported. And I think when you get to older kids like 10 and up, you have to give them more of the science and let them sort of get some accurate news that's science-based so that they understand because those kids are natural risk takers. They like to break the rules. They don't want anyone to tell them anything. And so that's why we saw like all those teenagers on spring break. Like they don't have any way of making a rational decision because their brains are still forming. So I think giving them as much of the information as is possible will help them follow those rules and keep them safe again. What about behavioral tips? for kids that are acting out because they're cooped up? So the big thing for that is we're all kind of acting out because we're cooped up. I think it's natural to have emotions about this and that they're big emotions. So we have to create situations where we can all release the steam, like that boiling pot. Because the thing is, is that we know that when we're stressed, our brains aren't working like rationally, we're not able to think through things. So making sure that you're getting outside, that you're getting some exercise, if you possibly can, naming the emotions when they're having those meltdowns saying, you must be feeling disappointed because you're missing your friends, or you might be angry because I can't let you go to the zoo, or being able to give them some names for those big emotions is good. And then sensory things are also good, like squeezing Play-Doh or punching pillows or stomping your feet and realizing that we all have to let off some steam. Well, punching a pillow is definitely better than punching a sibling. Exactly. (laughs) What about when the kid is, say, you know, when they learn how to speak and they're at that sweet spot age around between one and a half and two and they're saying no all the time and all you hear is no, 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 no. And then typically if you're a parent and you're working, you can go to work and only hear no's when you come home. But now you're stuck at home with your kids and all you hear is no. So what do you have for those parents? That's rough. 
And, and I'm not going to lie to you. It's rough for the nanny. It's rough for you. It's rough for the kids. So the best thing, and, and this isn't easy. You might not like this, but I guarantee you it's an investment that will pay off is if you, after the kids are in bed one night, pick one room or one area of the house that you can turn into an environment where you only can say yes. So if they're climbers, pick a room that you can only put things that are appropriate for them to climb on, low pillows or couches that are okay for them to climb on or block the bookshelves. If they're the kids that pull stuff off the shelf all the time, take everything off the shelf so there's nothing to pull or put stuff up on the shelf even better that it's okay if they pull it off. Find a room that you can sort of create this environment where you don't have to say no so much. If you can do that and spend some time there every day so that you have a period of the day where you're not having to say no as often, then it's gonna help you and it's gonna help them because that's how they learn is by doing those things. They learn about gravity by climbing. They learn about cause and effect from pulling things off of a bookshelf. So they're just trying to learn. So you wanna give them the opportunity to do that where you don't have to say no and they're not saying no back to you. I love that and actually we made a room where they can touch anything and it's pretty safe and that was a tip from our caregiver so I love that tip. What about meltdowns? When a child has a meltdown, my son is 10 months. He's always throwing his head back when he's upset. So what tips do you have for that? So like I said earlier, it's big emotions, right? We have all these big emotions right now. And those younger kids don't understand how to process those emotions yet. They don't have the emotional intelligence. Their brains aren't ready. So they're feeling very overwhelmed. So again, that idea of naming the emotions of connecting with them, sit down and be calm. Sit down on the floor next to them, breathe deeply through your nose and try to just be calm and be present for them and let them have it. It's like adults, like there are times when you feel like you're gonna explode and you might, you might yell at somebody or you stomp off or you whatever. It's just a more appropriate version of what the, they're going through. So if you can find a way to just be calm with them, let them have their emotions. Again, put some sensory stuff into your day. Play-Doh, putting their hands in a bowl of rice, like that feels good to them. Going outside and touching different textures, making a quiet the house quiet for a period of the day so they can have a calm thing. That can help with the meltdowns. I'm feeling a little overwhelmed because there's so many amazing moms far better than me out there that are on Pinterest and all these places with all these activities that they're planning. They're working and they're doing all these things like super moms. And I just want to find something easy to do with my child. And I don't want to put so much thought and effort into it. So for moms like me, what can we do that can help, uh, you know, occupy them, but we don't have to buy a bunch of supplies and plan a bunch of things. If you're the kind of person that loves to do that stuff and it brings you joy, then rock it out, sisters. But, um, but the truth of the matter is that we're in this state of that we've never been in as a society before where we're all sort of operating at like 10 plus. And so putting that extra pressure on us is just going to make it worse. So we have to give each other a break. We have to give our kids a break. Let your kids sort of guide you on how much they need. Maybe they just need to play. That's totally fine. Maybe they want you to be in the room with them while they play, but ignoring them, that's fine. Like whatever they need. I like to not believe in screen time generally, like during the week, we do a little bit on the weekend, but that's it. I think this is a time that we're lucky we have screens and that there's good content out there, right? So you want to use mindful content. There's amazing YouTube shows that you can watch to get their bodies moving. Cosmic Kids Yoga is my favorite thing ever that, that I've discovered in this period. So there are these amazing stories they retell. There's a frozen one and they put them in different yoga poses through the whole thing and it's fast moving so it engages kids very young but it also is yoga so it engages kids that are a little bit older too and they tell different stories they're about a half an hour long you can put one on and go in the other room and take that conference call get a cup of coffee go to the bathroom by yourself and that's a great one there's a bunch of zoos that have like different times of the day that you could pop it on and give yourself a break kids are not gonna be long-term affected by a month or two of some extra screen time. Like in the general picture of things, if it keeps you calm, it's well worth the time. What about the distance learning and now all the parents having to become teachers? 
which is so hard because a lot of them are working as well from home. So any tips for that? Yeah, I think it's important to remember that kids are who are in school, they're face to face with their teachers and their peers and they're moving their bodies a lot. And so their attention span is a little bit longer. We're sitting in front of a computer and sitting still and being on the screen, their attention span is about half of what it would be in a normal classroom. And it's already too much that we're expecting from kids. So give yourself a break, give your kids a break. If they're older, you know, second, third grade and up, try to make it as much there, give them the power to make decisions about their schooling. If they wanna do their homework at eight o'clock at night, instead of seven in the morning, who cares? Time is irrelevant right now anyway, that's fine. Like why fight a battle you don't have to fight? If they're getting it done, then let them do it. And however they want to get it done, save yourself the hassle and try and the stress of it all. If they're younger, I would try to break it up as much as possible. I know that schools have some mandatory times, but if there are optional things, they're going to learn. Kids are learners, like that's their job and they're going to do it. And they might learn if they're helping you with the laundry or they might learn if you're in the kitchen baking it doesn't have to be this distance learning components. You just need to do what the minimum is that you have to do and then follow your kids' sort of interest and, and abilities to do the rest. So in a world where we're always trying to overachieve, now is not the time. Parents need to relax, not overload themselves. If they want to give children real life learning instead of the textbook learning, if that's not their thing, that's okay. I love all those tips. I do, before we go, want to also talk about the Nanny Relief Fund that you are a part of and that you helped create because a lot of the caregivers right now are out of jobs because parents are afraid and rightfully so, they don't want anyone entering their homes during this uncharted time. So why don't you give us a little uh, information and how we can help? Sure. So we started the Nanny Relief Fund. It's brand new. We had we just raised a bunch of money the first weekend, but we need so much more because like you said, there are a lot of nannies in different situations and due to the nature of our work and so many factors that it would take forever to explain, there are a lot of nannies that need some financial assistance right now. So we are trying to provide that and you can go to nannyreliefund.org. I wrote it so nicely there as a reminder and make a contribution. And if you are a nanny employer, this is a great thing to do on behalf of your favorite nanny, or if you had a nanny in the past, you can give a shout out to her or him on the website. Nannies are a very caregiving group, like that's our nature. And most of us go above and beyond to care for not just the kids, but the whole families that we serve. But this is a time where we have to sort of take care of the caregiver. So anything that you can spare right now, I know it's kind of a hard time to ask for money, but it is desperately needed and we would appreciate it. I love that. And you guys are, help make our lives so much easier. So for any parents out there, anyone out there wanting to help the caregivers who help our families better themselves, feel free to go to nannyreliefund.org. Thank you so much, Sue, for joining us today. And thank you everyone for watching. Make sure to subscribe and like to my YouTube channel, Kavita Shanae TV, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Sue. Thank you.